Welcome to a new series on Beneath the Bible called Before You Read. In this series, we want to offer background information about books of the Bible to help you as you read them for yourselves. Now, there are lots of valuable resources out there to help you interpret what you read in the Bible. But in this series, we simply want to offer background and an overview of each book to help you as you interpret the Bible for yourself. We're starting this series with the Minor Prophets of the Old Testament. Let's jump into today's book now. Hosea is the first book of a section of the Old Testament that we call the Minor Prophets. Now, these books are called minor only because they're short, not because their message or significance is unimportant. In the Hebrew Bible, these books are together in a collection simply called the Twelve. The book of Hosea is a very colorful book, containing the preaching and teaching of a prophet named Hosea. It discusses how Israel has sinned against their covenant partner Yahweh, and how they will suffer judgment accordingly. Now, while proclaiming judgment, Hosea also offers hope for a new age of blessing, because God still loves his covenant people. The prophet uses the metaphor of adultery to express Israel's unfaithfulness to Yahweh. In the early chapters, God instructs Hosea to marry Gomer, a promiscuous woman, that is, a prostitute. Hosea and Gomer's relationship is used as a metaphor for Israel and God's relationship. God, like Hosea, is faithful and loving and even pursues their unfaithful partner after infidelity, while Israel and Gomer pursue other loves, in Israel's case, the worship of other gods. Now, it's worth noting that there has been a lot of discussion about Gomer and the nature of her infidelity. But for now, we're going to stick with the understanding that throughout the book, Gomer is the promiscuous woman, and the book is describing actual marital infidelity. The book of Hosea tells the story of Hosea and Gomer in the first three chapters, and includes a poem about how Israel's adulterous ways have brought disorder on them. But God has a redemptive plan to restore them to order and covenantal blessing. Chapters 4 through 14 include several instances of a literary genre called covenantal lawsuit. This would have been a culturally familiar type of literature for the Israelites. In Hosea, these lawsuits spell out several charges and grounds for the metaphorical divorce brought by God against Israel for things like their lack of devotion to God and their deceitfulness. The book is also interesting because it's a very difficult grammar and vocabulary. Sometimes it's hard to even understand what it's trying to be, what's trying to be communicated, which can make translation difficult. The book includes many words that are only used once in the Bible, which makes it difficult to know what the word actually means. Scholars call these one-time use words hapax legomena. The book likely reflects an Israelite or northern dialect, which differs from the Judahite Hebrew dialect we often see in the Old Testament. It also uses vibrant metaphors, wordplay, and draws on cultural practices that are often lost as we are removed from the original context and language. For example, Hosea 2.16 says, In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, you will no longer call me my master. Now this is clearly communicating the sense of restoration and closeness between Israel and God, but there's a wordplay here in Hebrew, where the word for master is Baal, so it's saying you will call me my husband and not my Baal which is playing on the charges of idolatry and infidelity against Israel, which are being reconciled. There are other cultural practices which are behind some of these phrases. For example, in Hosea 2.2, the phrase, She is not my wife, and I am not her husband, is almost certainly a commonly used stock phrase in legal divorce proceedings in Israel that's being drawn on here, applied to the context of Israel and God. While some scholars suggest that elements of Hosea were written after the life of the prophet, it's just as likely that the entire book was written by one individual. We don't know that much about the individual Hosea before he was called to be prophet. We're told he was the son of Eri, a person who is otherwise unknown to us, and the beginning of the book tells us that he was active during the reign of Jeroboam in Israel, but we don't know from which city he prophesied. We do know he married a woman named Gomer during his time as a prophet, and we know that Gomer had three children. Now, given the long career Hosea had, probably in excess of 30 years, and that he was unmarried when he began his career, it's likely that he was quite young when he was called as a prophet. While we don't know where he was from, the linguistic particularities of the text would suggest he was from the northern kingdom of Israel, not the southern kingdom of Judah, and that he probably delivered his message to those either in Samaria or at an Israelite cultic shrine at Bethel. It is also likely that he was a refugee who migrated to the southern kingdom of Judah after the fall of Samaria. 
We know from archaeological excavations that in the 8th century, the city of Jerusalem expanded in size quite significantly to encompass what is called the Western Hill. It is generally agreed that the city expanded due to an influx of refugees from the defeated Northern Kingdom, and it's possible that Hosea was part of this movement from the north. As with much of the rest, this is a speculation and informed guesses based on textual clues and some, some historical context. There isn't a lot of biographical clarity around the prophet himself. The first verses of the book say that Hosea was active during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah, as well as Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel. Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah reigned from the 780s when Uzziah became king until Hezekiah died in the mid-680s. The Jeroboam listed here is Jeroboam II, who reigned from the 780s to about 753. Hosea wasn't active during this entire time. He was likely active during the final years of Jeroboam's reign and probably died sometime early in Hezekiah's reign. This would mean he also served during the reigns of all of the final kings of Israel from Jeroboam to Hosea. Approximate dates for Hosea's activity would be maybe 755 to around 722 when Hezekiah was co-regent with his father Ahaz. This would put Hosea's prophetic activity around the same time as Amos, who came before him and whose work Hosea seems to be familiar with as well as Micah and Isaiah, who were active in Judah. According to Jewish tradition in the Babylonian Talmud, Hosea was the first of these contemporaries to prophesy. While some prophets give specific dates for elements of the work, Hosea doesn't. Some scholars have attempted to give more specific dating to his sermons, citing the impending wars mentioned in Hosea 5 and 8, but these are largely based on interpretation rather than historical certainty. This period had frequent wars, so isolating particular ones that fit the description in these chapters is difficult. Some scholars see the messages of hope in the text as inconsistent with the message in the rest of the book, uh, but despite this, there isn't any obvious reason to not see the book as being written during Hosea's lifetime or compiled shortly thereafter. The historical context for the book of Hosea is largely the same as when it was written, in the latter half of the 8th century. Scholars have identified a number of phases for Hosea's writing that correspond to different time periods, so it's hard to be specific because Hosea does not date his sermons in the same way other prophets did. We'll follow the understanding that the book was roughly, has roughly three phases of writing, where Hosea 1-3 through three was written during the reign of Jeroboam II, Hosea 4-11 through 11 were written either during or around the Syro ephraimite War, and Hosea 12-14 through 14 were written in the lead-up to and possibly after Mass of the Fall of Samaria. The first phase corresponds to the final years of Jeroboam II's reign. While the historical texts of the Bible remember Jeroboam and all the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel as bad, because of their idolatry, the reign of Jeroboam was otherwise prosperous. There is an interesting note in 2 Kings where the prophet Jonah is said to have brought a message of prosperity to Jeroboam despite him being undeserving. So while he was not a religiously orthodox king, he ruled over an economically prosperous and militarily successful period, especially for the upper classes. The kings of the Assyrian Empire were struggling with internal problems, which allowed polities like Israel to expand their borders and grow their wealth. That success, however, was not attributed to Yahweh, and Israel continued to pursue syncretistic religious practices. It is the idolatry of Jeroboam's time that Hosea is speaking out against. The prosperity of the northern kingdom changed following the death of Jeroboam II and his son Zechariah. The Assyrians had been in a period of stagnation, but the new king Tiglath-Pileser III made the Assyrians a resurgent threat. This was obviously bad for the states of Israel and Judah and the Aramean kingdom of Aram Damascus. Rezin, the king of Aram Damascus, and Pekah, the king of Israel, wanted to form a coalition of like-minded kingdoms to oppose Assyrian hegemony. They wanted Judah to join their coalition, but the Judahite king Ahaz refused. In 735, these two kings attempted to remove Ahaz as king in what is called the syro ephraimite War. It's called this because Aram Damascus is in Syria and Ephraim was the dominant tribal group in the northern kingdom of Israel. Things went poorly for Ahaz, as he had to fight not only the kingdom of Israel and their Aramean allies, but also the Philistines and the Edomites who joined in the attack. So Ahaz appealed to the Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser III, who had proved to be one of the Neo-Assyrian Empire's great conquering kings, and Assyria marched against Ahaz's aggressors. Tiglath Pileser was unsurprisingly victorious, but while Ahaz may have saved his throne, Tiglath Pileser demanded tribute for his troubles. Ahaz had to take wealth out of the temple in Jerusalem to pay the Assyrian king. Hosea continued to preach against idolatry during this period, but it seems few people were receptive to, have receptive to his message. The final phase of Hosea's prophetic activity, which roughly corresponds to chapters 12-14, through 14, corresponds to the final years of the Kingdom of Israel. 
Tiglath Pleasure III says he deposed Pekka and made Hosea king of Israel. Hosea played politics on the international stage, but he played them poorly. When the conquering king Tiglath Pleasure III died, Hosea plotted with Egypt to regain his independence. As you can imagine, the next Assyrian king, Shalmanassar V, found out and did not take it well. Shalmanassar besieged the northern kingdom's capital city of Samaria and took it after a three-year siege. The prophet Hosea likely fled Samaria before, before this and along with many others settled as a refugee in Judah. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.